Yeah, but it's my yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> you you brought a game with you. And you can use the game in the room. And ready. Okay, it would be nice to Penny. It would be really nice and agree with everything you said. I was going to make it out. Are you just going to your complex? Yeah, actually, I think that's funny. Yeah, that's actually one of their funny. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, this panel is called Blockchain and Law. There's some subtitle on it. I don't remember. Um, we all spend a lot of time together, actually. So this is like we just do this all the time anyway. So it's like now there's just a bunch of people in the room with us. Um, and we have like formal questions and stuff. We plan. Um, so yeah, so we're going to talk about Blockchain and Law. And um, we have a lot of time to sort of go through our agenda, and then maybe if people have questions for us at the end, uh, they can uh, go ahead and ask those at the end. Um, um, yeah, so I'm just going to pass the mic around, and people can uh, give their <coughs> short little backgrounds about themselves. Hi everybody, my name is Maria Gomez. Um, I used to be a corporate lawyer, but today I'm working in a project that's called Aragon. And so what we do is we build governance tools and applications for uh, blockchain native organizations uh, for the creation and governance of, of those new type of organizations. Hi, I'm Constance. Um, I started out my legal career uh, working the EFF, um, litigating, um, yeah. yes, fighting the good fight, uh, litigating issues of first impression in internet law, so dealing with um, issues that courts have never seen before because the technology is new. Um, and then I've worked for uh, big law firms, um, litigating cases for big tech companies before I discovered blockchain, and this was Bitcoin back then, in 2011. And then I was um, general counsel and chief compliance officer at Kraken for four years. And then now we run this, uh, run this wonderful community called Koala, which all of these panelists are our members and some of you guys in the audience. Um, we are a community of like-minded legal experts, academics, researchers, economists, technologists, the whole shebang. And we get together at workshops and conferences across working groups trying to solve um, deeply troubling issues that are common to us all. Um, legal frameworks, new kinds of tools, and how to develop policy and culture in this Hi, my name is Rick Dudley. Um, primarily what I do is I'm a mechanism designer in the blockchain space, so I have clients and I help them to build projects that are incentive aligned so that they actually really do fulfill the promise of blockchain technology and provide the safety guarantees that the users expect. Um, and in that capacity, I oftentimes also have to make sure that the project is in some vague sense, at, the, at least remotely legally compliant. Um, so I, I spend a lot of time discussing with you know various lawyers in various places, um, how do we structure these things and not run afoul of the law? Um, and so uh, actually, really prior to that, I, I was in Koala. Um, um, yeah, and I still am in Koala, uh, so, yeah, it's a present tense. Um, um, but yeah, so so I'm mostly in Koala, I'm, not, I'm the non-lawyer in the room most of the time, so I'm sort of helping people to um, understand the technology side, the Ethereum side in particular, and uh, I'll be moderating the panel. My name is Silvia Rufai, and I'm the Chief Legal Officer at Gnosis. Um, we build decentralized infrastructure on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, you might know the Multisig wallet, our new um, our Nosa Safe. Um, we have prediction market protocols. And um, also we're working on um, decentralized exchanges. My role is mainly to make our products um, dispute resistant. Um, prior to joining Gnosis, I worked in the case in uh, financial regulatory um, concerns like finance, uh, compliance, and um, also international arbitration. 
I'm Penny, I'm the Associate General Counsel at MIC, so we are a professional decentralized student group. I've been dabbling in the blockchain space for the last few years, working on various different uh, projects from community currencies and financial inclusion um, to now working with the Liquor Dow team. Um, before that, I was a corporate lawyer, I focused on SEC investigations and capital markets transactions. Um, in my first life, I, was, I worked on Wall Street as a research analyst. Okay, further, I work at Rose East, and you'll soon find out that I'm also not here. Um, so I've been in the blockchain space for some time. I think I noticed I work on comp strategy, but I originally came to know the Koala community from working on a small cooperative, which I set up like articles of association for and tried to do a distributed cooperative form in 2014. Um, and that community came to be an advisor and a community member of the Interplanetary Database Foundation, which is kind of a throwback now, but I think that's how I came to know you guys. So looking at a kind of model of decentralized stewardship on a human level of decentralized protocols and thinking through that. So my background is more in kind of writing and research practice rather than law specifically and organizing. Okay, so, um, you know, we have an outline uh, I don't know, I probably won't uh, keep it entirely a mystery, but uh, I will be somewhat curious. Um, but the basic idea is to sort of provide an introduction to what we think are salient legal questions uh, in the blockchain space, um, which may not be what you think are salient questions, and then we can sort of suss that out at the end. Um, but yeah, let's uh, start. I mean, anyone can sort of respond to the question, uh, what is a legality? And um, so in, in the sort of the blockchain space, we sort of talk about extra legal or unstoppable applications. And oftentimes there's a, there's a legal undertone or a legal subtext to those statements that is actually predicated in this concept of illegality. Um, and it would be entirely unclear to a lay person, or even in some cases, even someone with a legal background, uh, what that means or how that applies. So, um, Constance, do you want to? Sure. So, what we mean by illegality is, and, and you know, I'd like to hear what you guys mean by think about this, is, you know, it's, it, we're not talking about things that are legal per se, i.e., already defined, you know, by a specific uh, law or regulation. We're not talking about things that are illegal. Um, illegality is what we refer to as things that exist currently outside of the view of the law today. So when we think about um, unstoppable code, uh, uh, we often think, oh, what we're really talking about is the, is the blockchain reality. And there is a blockchain reality, but we forget that there's also a physical legal reality. So people participating in that code, the development of the code, um, people participating in the project, all of whom have a, a, a legal and physical presence in the real world. Um, and so what we, when we talk about illegality, we, we're really trying to figure out how do we make this blockchain reality correspond and deal with this physical, real reality, legal reality, maybe not real, legal reality that exists for many of us who work in this space. I think um, what, illegality is very easy to, to grasp if you just refer to the ordered, the disordered, and the unordered. We are basically in an unordered space, and I think uh, in the long, I mean, right now there's a lot of regulation happening, so the unordered space is becoming less unordered, so it's becoming more ordered or disordered depending on uh, where we stand. Do you want to expand a bit on which one's ordered, which one's unordered, and which one's disordered? regulatory perspective, if I'm the regulator, um, anything that doesn't comply with the new overarching or overreaching regulation in several countries would be disordered. Um, and the unordered, our illegal space becomes smaller and smaller. But that is up to debate, so you might have a different opinion on this. No, I just, that's for the benefit of the audience. Sometimes I'm not sure if there's complete illegality because as long as there's human interaction, there's a set of, even when we don't have codified rules or regulations, what's the ground by which we operate together as part of our human interaction? Right? So if I take a very common law approach and I think about um, 
there's there's laws, but there's also principles. There's a constitution, right? That's that grounds the legality of all the subsequent laws that are enacted by Congress or by um, regulatory agencies. So, so there's a there's a pecking order, right? We start in, in the U.S. legal culture. We start with the Constitution, which is a, a piece of uh, written literature um, as opposed to the English Constitution, which is unwritten. But it's a it's a set of those grounding principles. Um, and then on top of that, we have laws passed by Congress, and then on top of that, um, we have regulations that are put out by enforcement agencies that interpret the law. Right. So increasingly, lots of law kind of falls in that top space. It's, it's you know, if we talk about things in a very concrete way, as we all know, we're all scared of the SEC. We're all scared of enforcement actions. Right. So they're operating at that level, um, and we kind of want to look at well, what are these grounding principles that make that, that, that give a justification for these subsequent regulations and laws. Um, so I think, you know, DAOs get the opportunity to rethink the relational aspects of um, human interaction, and code is just a way of executing those human inter interactions and what the values are uh, between various parties. Always, when we are talking with lawyers, um, and um, I used to be a lawyer, not doing it anymore. But one of the things that I always notice whenever we talk about legality is that we are always referring to this legal system coming from the governments, um, and so what, that's why, like sometimes we say, a legality is something that is not ordered. But sometimes we find order uh, uh, coming from legal systems, coming from the from the private parties. Um, so it doesn't mean that we are not ordered uh, if it is outside the legal system or that there are no rules at all. Um, there are now new uh, projects or, or these blockchain organizations, these new systems, they are um, self-organizing in a way and trying to impose this or to create this new system um, that is parallel and it's outside of the, of the legal traditional one. Uh, just, just one quick follow up, you know, in terms of this kind of unordered space, eventually that unordered space becomes ordered. There are forces that shape the way law is formed. It's slow, but but it, it moves, it moves in, in a particular arc. And without, you know, new kinds of projects and new kinds of thinking and innovation, and what happens is that the kinds of forces that shape the political economy, which lead to the laws that we then see later on, are going to be at play. So these are large stakeholders, incumbents, um, entire systems, you know, people with more resources. So it's, when, when we say, people often think, oh, if there isn't a particular law for, for you know, blockchain, that means the law doesn't apply. There are many areas of law that already apply that are, have yet to be imposed as an ordering on the space. And yet, it will be ordered, and, and, and what we are really interested in as a community is how do we shape that ordering? And that can be done through building new projects, um, changing the market forces, changing the, our collective uh, culture and what everyone believes will work or won't work. So all of these things are equally important as we as we look at whether laws exist or do not exist that apply to us today. Um, I wanted to reply to you, Maria on like you know the, the privately ordered space. So um, we are trying to order ourselves, um, but that order or like what we what is unordered um, by regulation, but ordered by ourselves that is sanctioned by the state. So as long as they, they're happy with what they're doing, um, as long as we're good in self-regulation, they don't interfere, but if, if we're not, then the, what we do, I mean, does affect, I mean, us, does come into play with the, we might get into um, conflict with the public space, basically. So I think what we want to discuss here to, um, today also is what can you actually order privately and what can you not order privately? Sure. Um, so I just want to also bring it back. I feel like there's a common conception in this space that illegality almost translates to a kind of 
autonomous legality, and that there was early on a misconception based on the term smart contract that there is some type of contract law somehow embedded in how these technical consensus protocols run, when it actually is not one to one matchup. So I think a lot of what you said about shaping the relational space, where if you have these principles and law is not always necessarily an, an external appeal, so you would think, not necessarily on-chain, off-chain, but if you kind of externally appeal to outside the community, or like an extra judicial force, um, like what are the points of those contacts? So if you order yourselves correctly privately, you can also strategically choose like what are the points of contact when you do seek a court of law, when you do seek questions of liability, and other questions a lot, in large part concerned about responsibility and liability. So I think that's a very good point and um, a good sort of transition. I'm just going to quickly say uh, I think the process that the blockchain community is experiencing now is you exist in this illegal framework with like unawareness, right? I mean, it's like your ignorance of the law. You do, people don't know what the laws are. They don't understand how the law works, and and they also coincidentally land. And this is actually an interesting thing about the, the blockchain community as a whole. Some of us have landed very much squarely in the illegal space, whereas some of us have landed very squarely in the illegal space um, for the same reason, right? You just you didn't you weren't aware of the law, you weren't paying attention, whatever, and you just were doing your thing. And some people thought their thing was going to be cool, and they were really wrong. And so we are as a community going through this process of ordering the space and and formalizing um, as a community what we're doing and the and the the real risk is as a community if we start to um, again out of ignorance create an ordering that is in conflict with the law right because what's going to happen is we're going to have a set of community norms that we all believe are true and valid and legal again because people make law outside of the government but we will have formed a set of laws that are in conflict with the laws that we all uh, operate under. To put that in a very concrete term, um, it's great that we can have this conference here and we're not like a biker gang, right? Like, a biker gangs have their own law, they operate outside the law, they literally call themselves outlaws and have outlaw badges and go to outlaw parties. And, like, you know, these parties are funner. Um, there's a lot of benefits to not being an outlaw party. Um, you know, pros and cons, right? Um, and so I think for most of us here in the blockchain space, we're trying to align our ordering process with this other legal ordering process. Um, and um, so apropos of that, I'm going to ask the next, the next question, the next prompt, which I think is something that um, oftentimes comes up in the space and, and uh, also is a, a, you know, touches back to some of these other conversations about contracts and, and this use of, use of terms. You know, why can't we just make smart contracts between us and call it a day, right? Like, why is it that we can't um, just have like these sort of weird computer-mediated bilateral agreements that are, you know, interesting and unique in their own right? But um, like, why aren't these new forms of private agreements sufficient to protect um, our activity again as we sort of move through this unordered space into an ordered space? Why isn't it sufficient? For just you know three people in this room to get together, throw you know throw some stuff on a computer, and why isn't that like a, a sufficient um, protection? And I, I don't know who's starting. It's not constant, so who wants to go? Um, basically, the what I earlier spoke spoke about is that in relation to this, is we are fine doing private ordering as long as we don't violate the public the law, the criminal law, and administrative law. So that's what we have to focus on. And the moment we do that, um, we have a problem, or we might not because no one realizes it, but we rather not have that problem. Yeah, so going back to Kay's point about smart contracts being a misnomer, um, I think there's, this, there's a train of thought in the space that everything can be codified in, into code. Um, but a smart contract is really just the enforcement piece of a contractual relationship. It doesn't encompass the totality of a contractual relationship, which includes elements like, is there a meeting of the minds? Right? So there's this conflation that says the execution of some function, the enforcement of, of some function, is also the evidence of the intentions, when in fact we have an 
outcome, but the whole dispute between two people is whether or not that is the correct outcome that accords with the expectations of the parties. So that's necessarily, I think, something that falls outside of the scope of the code, right? The code could be evidentiary of what the intentions of the party are, but it's not by itself the totality of that, of, of the, of that relationship. But what's the difference then to a paper contract? Well, the well, paper contract also contains many other provisions, and there's also other activities that, that can be evidentiary of a relationship between the parties, right? Couldn't well, I just write all of that into my contract? Yeah. In yeah. my smart contract? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that, that what we're really talking about there, the difference between, in, in sort of lay terms, the difference between um, a smart contract and, and a written contract, a paper contract, is that when you go through the process of signing up a paper contract, you've demonstrated some meeting of the minds already, right? And, and you've demonstrated that in some relationship to the greater law. Like, people don't say, oh, I signed this. Well, it does happen, actually, where you have very ignorant people, and they're like, I signed this contract because I got up some ice cream. And then you're like, okay, well, obviously that like failed to meet the qualifications of a, a legal contract. And I, I think that what we have in the blockchain space is people who didn't like the concept of a legal contract, didn't like the concept of a legal agreement, sort of just wished away uh, the law's relationship. But how is this different to like, um, you know, an oral contract, for example? I mean, you don't need a written contract, and it's sometimes people, as you just said, the guy with the ice cream, it happens all the time. I don't see a difference in that. I don't think the difference is in the sort of formal structure, right? The difference is in, you know, quite literally, the minds of the people in the agreement, right? When we talk about people in this community making smart contracts and smart contracting systems, they are not, well, some of them are the person who's like, oh, I got some ice cream, so I like took this token or whatever, but a lot of the people really do, are trying to construct, their intent is to create something that exists in an illegal frame but they're failing to do, they don't, they're not going through the steps necessary to really achieve that. And, and that, so I think that's the difference, it's the intent of the people uh, in the process. Yeah, I think there are many like nuanced reasons why they're different. One is just historically and use of force um, in terms of like what to see the century where it was is at. Maybe there is enough historical grounds and other like extra teachers. So, and that contracts actually are meeting of the minds, but right now there's like a really vague space between terms of service for using software and also entering into like a multi-party contract agreement. <laughs> and like, am I going to have liability for a DAO that I signed up with for MetaMask like 10 years ago? Um, and because that software did something and I haven't participated for a long time, it's something I'm liable for it, that feels a lot different than I am signing a contract for employment or for receiving funds. And just also to answer very shortly one more reason why I think that legality and code is not sufficient is simply because from hanging out with you guys, I learned that there isn't necessarily the law. There are actually like a lot of laws. And there isn't necessarily like the kind of blockchain protocol. There are a lot of technical disagreements about protocol upgrades. So it's that lack of homogeneity that also makes it very difficult to match the two up. Um, so talk about international law and different jurisdictions and so forth. Um, just you know, back to the original question of you know, why is it enough to, to call Smart, con smart contracts and call it a day is just you know, two concrete examples. You know, a group of people for blockchain, um, lots of people are participating, um, you know, everyone has the best of intentions. All of a sudden, you have an assassination contract that's launched on mainnet, and you thought you guys were just a group of people, or you thought you were just contributing to a code for a particular project, and all of a sudden, the law sweeps in, and apart from this blockchain reality and all the agreements you made, that then deem you a general partner in a, in, a, in a general partnership and liable for all the acts of everybody who participated. So this is where it's, it's really, there is, there is a, a, a physical, legal reality with states, nation states that have the use of force that, that operate on your projects, even if you can't see it right now. So that's just one clear example. Um, I just want to add that as, as long as, as, as we have humans, um, and for example, in this blockchain native organizations, even if um, some processes they can be encoded in smart contracts, these organizations are being formed by humans. So there are subjective constraints that um, that are needed and that are impossible to codify 
Um, so, to, I was talking before about self-governance uh, and how we could like, create these rules, new rules system. Um, and a way to, the, the, the problem with that is that whenever there is a dispute, for example, it, to, to decide what is according to those rules or not is very subjective. Um, and so that's why uh, just as my projects are not enough. Uh, one of the solutions that, that, that we are working on is, is, is something like the core, which is an oracle. And um, yeah, so it's, uh, that oracle will decide, which is, uh, works with humans, will decide that what is, what is um, if certain action within an organization is according to, the rules, to those rules or not. Um, we cannot do that. Dowhawk is a perfect example of that. You know, the attacker actually said, thank you for, if, if the code is really law, I follow the law, and thank you for all the money. And actually the community decided that was not the outcome that they wanted, and they wanted to overrule this blockchain smart contract reality. So, you know, there's, there's, there's that human layer, just as you said, that, that we need to take into account as we build this infrastructure that's ultimately meant for, for all of us humans to do, to, to interact with. And, and just briefly, I think it's interesting to note in the case of the DAO, um, the reason the code wasn't law was because you know the you know ultimately the issue that arose was not from the author of the contract that was exploited, right? And the underlying issue was a mismatch between two parts of the stack below what that developer wrote, and we can sort of get into this. I, I mean, I think that depending on how much of a software nerd you are, there's this really fascinating philosophical discussion around programming languages and why would we ever want to use a language where such an, a problem can even emerge, right? But here we are in reality where we have those languages and there's, there's no way that you can legitimately argue, well, okay, there's conspiracy theories that are somewhat extreme, but outside of those, it's very clear that um, the intent of the original publishers of the DAO was not to have the DAO hack happen. Right? So we can all look at that and agree. I mean, the, again, the vast majority of, obviously not everyone, but the vast majority of people can look at that event and say, okay, well, the code that should be law is the code that actually, like, the person who wrote the code had an intent, and that intent was clear, and the fact that there was a bug in underlying code like obfuscated that intent. And if you're having that sort of level of complexity in your discussion about code as law, like if your code is that sophisticated, which is actually like the vast majority of code, the DAO wasn't a particularly sophisticated piece of software. So if, if we can't express simple things like the DAO in these unambiguous terms, then we're going to be stuck having humans try to mediate to resolve these issues in one form or another, whether that's through like an Aragon sort of uh, module or through something else. Um, Billy, do you want to remember your question later and we can come back to it? Thank you. Um. One thing I wanted to say to that is that we, the, the, DAO, the, one, the DAO team could actually have made this a legal contract. It could have set up a contract saying code is law and maybe um, this um, legal system is, the choice of law is England and Wales or something else. And then you know you would have had some kind of a backup. So if you want code, code is law, you can set up a contract to actually state that. Or you need that in addition to this, you would need to have a legal system that catches all the other things that you have missed out on it. Yeah. So I think for this community, the the reason people don't do that, and uh, again, if you're not a lawyer, that just seems like, especially in America, I don't know, maybe lawyers, I mean, hopefully lawyers are expensive everywhere, but, um, you know, hopefully we didn't just get the short end of the stick, or it's like we only live in the countries where law is expensive. I mean, hopefully law is expensive everywhere, and, and it's not only the expense that provides people anxiety, but it's like you're opening up this whole new world. You're basic, because, I mean, this is, I think, one of the things that it's easy to misunderstand if you're a lay person, which is, you know, just because you don't know what the law is doesn't mean that you're not subject to the law. You can't like plead ignorance to the law. You can't say, oh, I wrote, wrote, I drove over this person because I didn't know it was illegal. 
right? And so in the same vein, your suggestion is a perfectly reasonable suggestion as a lawyer, which is I should pro pro provide myself some legal protection by at least like writing something down and notarizing it. But for other people, they feel that that's like opening Pandora's box and that's inviting the law into their situation to make it worse, not make it better. And I think that, I mean, that's literally why we're here on this panel, to sort of dissuade people uh, from that line of reasoning. And if you want to stick, stay away from any legal jurisdiction, um, if you choose as your dispute resolution arbitration, you could also actually not take a, 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 a territorial jurisdiction as your um, a choice of law. You can actually take rules of law. So if the Ethereum community would want to make you know, rules of law, like Aragon right now is creating something like that, you could actually put that in there because most arbitration laws or international arbitration laws they allow you to do that so we could create some law legal system ourselves and refer to it in our contracts um, in our dispute resolution mechanism but we haven't gotten that far I mean we could do that um, I think it was a great it's a great idea and we are actually working on this just on the arbitration point I think there's more flexibility in choosing the procedural rules for a dispute resolution, but the substantive rules. Yeah, but the substantive but I don't think you can violate um, like mandatory laws. No, we are. So you cannot. So I worked for ten years in international arbitration, and and, and Fanny also. So we have um, a, a bit of a dispute on this question. My position on this is you cannot, you cannot violate mandatory laws. I mean, you cannot um, use cogents. I mean, this is um, like torture, or you cannot um, any of the human rights that are enshrined in international law. But on a substantive level, it's not just procedural. You can actually come up with your own rules on that. Um, but you cannot. You, can you give an example for the non-lawyers about what one of these rules that you can make up would, would be? Like consent, I think that, that that's the best way. The consent, how you give a consent. In UK, consent can be also, yeah. I say, hey, it's good, I've seen so, it. Yeah, so actually that um, Anna has a very good idea. It's, it's, if you, you could say, for example, signature requirement. In your, if you, you could say that um, the transaction um, signature is the signature under that uh, under your uh, contract, and then you wouldn't need to follow um, jurisdictional signature requirements. So that would, for example, be a rule. You can very much adapt it to your own um, legal system you choose. But, for example, I mean, we worked on initializing the DXDAO, but we realized, I mean, there isn't yet this uh, system of rules we had, that is being developed, so it doesn't exist yet. So we had to look at a jurisdiction. We had to, had to take a choice of law of a jurisdiction. So you need a jurisdiction that has very uh, that allows you to do this. So it doesn't function in all jurisdictions. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't function in all jurisdictions. Sorry to cut you off at the last line there. So we do have an agenda. Can I get my question? Yes. Yeah, Billy. Really, uh, you're so close, I'm going to try to hand the mic to no, you. Oh, no, okay. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about Coda's law, and uh, it's not often that I have a bunch of lawyers in the room. Uh, and I was curious if you guys would talk about the sort of interpretation of Coda's law from the non-blockchain perspective of sort of the interpretation of law. If it was uh, to be interpreted as it was intended originally, you know, this is a big sort of this debate in the Supreme Court in America, and how sort of like Coda's law and traditional law could be about really interpreting the actual English you know what I mean, and like, and where that stands, or how is that juxtaposed in today's current law climate? Yeah, so we have uh, long arguments about this because, um, technically, I think, I mean, I guess there's a, in this, well, in Koala broadly, they're from all over the world, right? And so there's all different laws. I mean, this panel coincidentally is mostly, I think, U.S. law, but maybe not. I mean, I don't know what the split is. I'm not, I can't count apparently. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely, um, a, yeah, so there's definitely, I think, a question around, um, like, in the U.S. context versus the European context, the common law context, context um, yeah, so again, technically in that previous statement, uh, the U.K. is not part of the EU, uh, I don't know what I just said, um, but, um, the UK is part of the EU. yeah, I, I, I think that, 
there's, um, I'm going to let the lawyers actually answer the question. <laughs> Sorry, I, didn't, I didn't want to think I was answering the question. Um, I don't know who wants to, who wants to answer it, of, of the lawyers. Sorry. So, um, you know, what I've been I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with John Perry Barlow's um, Declaration of Independence in Cyberspace. So this was, you know, when the internet was new and we thought this was this open, free space that's free from nation states and, and, and unfair enforcement mechanisms where we could all learn and live and play together on this wonderful World Wide Web. And, you know, um, if you read it, it's, it's, it's beautiful, but it almost seems quaint today because Eventually, we realized that um, you know, these networks that we created still were operated by people, businesses who live in this political economy and shaped by the market, shaped by legal forces, shaped by culture, shaped by norms. And that's how we see the internet today, which is very much not an independent sphere of cyberspace. So when we say CODIS law, you know, it, it, we're, we're kind of drawing on this very long tradition of technologists or people who are innovating at the edge of new technologies who think that they have somehow um, create, escaped the law and created a space where they can make their own rules. And, um, you know, there's, again, there's, there's a lot of split between different jurisdictions about how, you know, in, in operationalized, literally what that means in terms of how code is interpreted. And, 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 but in, in, the, in, I think, the broadest sense that we've been approaching this question is, um, is it enough to make private agreements with technology, or do we need to take um, the law, all the laws, and, and the, the politics and the culture that come with the building of laws um, into account as we build this stuff? Anyone else have a comment? No, we don't. We're skipping that. So, what we're going to do for the sake of everyone's sanity is imagine these two right next to each other arguing at length about common law and civil law and, and boring all of you. So, we're skipping that. So, that's from Billy's question. Billy would have, in alternate reality, I pass them the mic and they just argue about it. And no one wants to hear any of it. So, okay, we're not, we're not doing that. Um, but this is apropos uh, the next question, which is, you know, um, do we need to reform the law? Um, uh, do do legal, are legal reforms necessary for the community to achieve its desired goals? I think is probably the, the most succinct way of putting that. And I think that. Um, what was the question? Uh, yeah. Um, does. Do we need legal reform to accomplish the community's goals? Uh, definitely not, not yet. I think um, we are just starting. Um, we are just start, uh, starting to have, uh, actually, in, in, at least in the, in the case of organizations, native, um, smart contract native organizations, we are just starting um, to have those. People are just starting to, to use these new tools. And I think uh, you know the farm right now. I mean, we. I, I really believe that the, these new rules are going to come from this private sector first. Um, I, I I always put this example of the London um, Exchange X talk. It was initially called Jonathan's Coffee House in the in the 18th century, and and, and that became what what it is today. Uh, uh, London Exchange uh, talk, and so I really believe that that uh, these initial rules are going to come from us. This initial system, and even ourselves, we are going to enforce those rules as well. Um, these coffee houses were like private clubs in, in, in the 18th, 18th century, and uh, the the governments they they didn't wanted to to recognize those rules, and they were not enforcing them. So the pe people they organized and they create, they, they enforce, make sure that they were enforcing those rules, and, and that's how this is the new system that we have. And so private private governance um, is effective, and I think it's, it's for us it's going to be necessary now. Uh, I, I think I agree and disagree, which is um, uh, are we going to achieve as a community today writing uh, different uh, SEC rules? Probably not. Um, but I think if we broaden the idea
idea of what legal reform means and to how do we shape the way the law is going to work now and in the future, I think we have enormous space and that can be done in, in, in a lot of areas of private governance, which Aragon is working on. But, you know, we, we talk a lot about regulatory capture and market capture. And, these, and as we move from this unordered space into an ordered space, if we don't take a proactive approach to figuring out how do we make our processes sound, how do we meet the kinds of goals that we can all agree on, you know, um, protecting consumers, having freedom to contract, um, you know, promoting innovation and creativity, uh, making sure criminal acti activities aren't conducted on our networks. If we can't come up with ways and means using the infrastructure that we have to deal with these problems, the what will happen is as we move into this unordered, into the ordered space, the forces that always shape the way, the, the, the entropy toward centralization, the, the forces that are that are powerful today will continue to shape that in the future, and we'll see what happens with the internet happening to to crypto, and you're already seeing it with Libra and others. So we really need to figure out, you know, how do we as a community build the road and the rules today while we still have space and capacity to do that um, as the law starts catching. That's really correct. And also what I see as one of the opportunities as a non-lawyer, and I don't think blockchain is the only example of this, but I think normally when we kind of choose terms of service or interact with software, we feel like we're contracting with a corporate entity. Um, but in the case of more distributed systems, you're kind of contracting with a network of nodes, potentially more things, potentially other things. So in non-legal terms, like that relational aspect of reorienting how we interact with software to be more about um, kind of entering into agreement with a network of several different parties and have common responsibility. Because what I hear is the tension point in a lot of our conversations is how do you manage liability and responsibility and pseudonymity? Um, and that seems to be the kind of core tension of how do we introduce to a more um, refined legal space, like preserving the ability to interact pseudonymously while interacting responsibly. And that's one of the major points for me. And, and yeah, uh, just to sort of um, add to that, the, um, the um, sorry, the feedback is really bugging me. Um, you know, we're also, when you talk about, uh, you know, uh, anonymity and providing, you know, maintaining some sort of privacy, part of that is also um, somewhat circularly to avoid exposing yourself to laws that you otherwise wouldn't be exposed to. Right, and, 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 and also even more, uh, to take that a step further, um, you know, not all laws are just, right? And we don't all, you know, we all have our own sense of justice and our own sense of morality and our own sense of ethics. And maybe I think it's ethical to, and maybe everyone I know thinks it's ethical for me to do some illegal thing in some other country. And in order for me to do that, I need to protect my identity, right? And, um, to stop those people from coming after me or, or you know, harming the counterparties that I'm interacting with or what have you. And so there, I think there's a benefit when I mean, we're constantly thinking about like assassination markets and like kidnapping children and child porn and all this stuff, but that same protection um, can work to actually create like a more just and ethical environment. And, um, and especially when we're talking about stuff like, you know, the like Aragon, like, you know, the, it's allowing people to have a, 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 an agreement that is more just than what they could actually get within a legal framework, right? And I think that's that's actually sort of the um, rhetoric for why we engage in this, you know, potentially engage in this process pre-reform. Uh, I definitely think that there are there are specific areas of law that do need reform because they're fundamentally an opposite of core tenets of um, how blockchains work. So when you think about crypto assets, crypto assets are their assets, meaning whoever holds and controls that asset, they are the owner, right? Um, versus registered assets, which means they, they have to be named. Um, so a lot of what crypto assets are, are, are bearer assets that behave as 
as the functions of registered assets, meaning that they, they behave like securities in the sense that they are economic incentive tools, but instead of saying only a certain class of folks who are named, who are accredited, can access that, that set of um, instruments, we want everyone to be able to access that. And that's fundamentally opposed with how securities law functions, where whereby you cannot be a bearer asset if you're a security, right? That's just part of the law, you have to be registered. There's There are these regist uh, regulated inter uh, intermediaries that um, serve particular functions. So I, I think that's a, it's a fundamental aspect of the law that needs to be changed, and that also goes into corporate governance and who can participate in the governance of something that doesn't quite look like a traditional corporation. Um, we're trying to build public commons, digital public commons, but we need an incentive mechanism that allows anyone to participate. So, so it could be a revenue share model, well that traditionally looks like a, a security, then that means there are all these tools around who can access that, right? So we're constantly at heads with, these, with this friction of, of an existing legal regime that doesn't match. Um, and lawmakers are, at least in the states, aren't really going to do anything about it anytime soon. So you have regulators like the SEC trying to figure out what's the best way to balance a space where, for them, it is a legal in the sense that um, they've got you know, 50, 60, 70 years of securities law that says, once a security, always a security. What is this morphing thing that goes from a security to a non-security? So they kind of have to make that up, even though they don't really have that kind of lawmaking power. Right? This goes back to where is the legitimacy of the law comes from. So they're kind of operating in that gray area and they're doing these weird settlements to try to say, okay, you were early, you didn't kind of know what the law was, um, you're not a pure fraud, you're doing something innovative that might bring lots of value. So here am I going to cause more damage by shutting you down and preventing you from having this asset? Or you know you can kind of tort and pay, um, and that's a cost of doing business in this space, and we'll let you go and experiment. Right. So there's so there's there's a real concrete way in which I think there there's that friction, and and government agencies don't actually know they're they're actually in an illegal space where they don't know how to how to proceed. I just want to add super quickly, um, I naively really love the idea that what could be produced is different and new types of definitions of financial assets. I think that would be fantastic. That's obviously uphill. Okay. I think um, we also need to um, propose regulation um, in the DAO space because in the DAO space there are more and more people are entering that um, the ecosystem. Um, they do not know, most people do not know what legal liabilities are attached to that. One example a lot of people do not think about is, for example, if you get a grant from a DAO, um, and the, the DAO, there's, the DAO is anonymous, you do not know where the money actually comes from, um, you might be implicating yourself in like terrorist financing um, activities just by taking the money. So, Organizations that you know are, com you know, if you have a company and then you get a grant from a DAO, in strict sense, you would have to ask yourself, well, are, are, am I sure that this money is not coming from some terrorist organization or some um, organization that is, in the eyes of some big government, considered to be um, terrorist or um, AML related? If you do that, and if that were the case then you basically might implicate yourself. No one ever thinks about that, and there are other questions like that. And because of that, there needs to be um, protection for the developers, for the people who are actually in the space, and we are the ones who have to propose it. We are the ones who have to propose those laws to the regulator, because if we don't do it, they are going to do it for us. Opportunity here because the internet came before us, and we have one example of where the architecture of the law did not fit with this new kind of architecture, and there needed to be a long and slow process of how to develop, how to how to make these things consistent. Um, and in here, we have the same problem. We have laws that are based in geographic, real, physical jurisdictions that uh, assume that there are centralized organizational structures like the board. Um, identified participants, so you have laws that are all framed around this particular 
plumbing. And then you have this technology that is enabling all sorts of different things. People from all over the world to participate on projects at scale. Who then, who, who still nevertheless live in some, in these physical jurisdictions. So, the, so, so right now there is a lot of belief in that this can be a game changer. And that means entities, organizations like agencies like the SEC are, are taking a wait and see approach and taking these careful selective one-off steps to try to figure out how to deal with this because they actually don't know how. So, you know, a lot of people, one of the earliest cases I worked on in my career was the YouTube icon case, and it was an open question whether YouTube could exist. And it was a negotiation of powers between um, the content creator, between uh, the, the copyright holders, which were these large organizations, you know, and, and the entities in Hollywood, had um, regulators, politicians who largely get their money from a lot of these large organizations. You had then also um, the fact that YouTube already existed with billions of users, um, which was also a, a market force. And then we also had the narrative of what we want to protect, whose rights are at stake. Do we want to promote creativity? Would this particular law, you know, stifle or promote creativity or protect copyright holders or not? So right now we are in the same space where the things that we're building, the, the, the rules that we're making amongst ourselves, the products that we're building, the values that we put behind those products are all going to have an impact on how law is, is reformed and how law is being reformed today. So these are, these are all things that we can do today. And uh, with that, I think we're going to wrap up the rest of our time with questions and answers. Um, I don't know, you should, people should probably try to walk up here because we're on a wired mic to ask their questions. Or yell, I guess, or be very loud. That also works. Um, the first hand to go up was a standing gym. Yes, um, it seems there's like this tension where new stuff gets created and then you kind of retroactively type, like try to find the best way to make it work with laws or to update the laws and things like that. Um, and almost any new thing that gets created, whether it's YouTube, whether it's the ERC-20, whether it's a DAO, obviously like runs the friction with existing laws. So as like people who are like more on the engineering side and the builder side, how should we like think about that? How should we think about you know, sort of tension between like if you do want to have innovation, of course you know you're gonna you're gonna uh, end up uh, not fitting in the existing frameworks and. And on Ethereum, we've seen specifically there's been like this approach of like, the people that were early kind of got an easier way out of that, even though they they, were, they, they kind of ran into the laws. Um, but, but yeah, I'm just curious how you think about that, like this tension between building something new and, uh, and being interested. So before the lawyers answer, I'm going to mention that A, it's not legal advice. I always love saying that. <laughs> and, and B, um, it obviously depends on where you live, right? I mean, this is a very much a jurisdictional dependent uh, response, and so I keep that in mind when people take their answers. I would say that, um, uh, and I think actually this was something that I didn't talk about it. I, I would recommend um, to, to the innovators and the technologists to always have a lawyer, right? And, and that lawyer will help you um, navigate these waters of, you know, innovating while being compliant. At least that, at least that you don't end up in jail, you know. Um, as, <laughs> and as long as, as 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 you are protected that way, uh, I think that some lawyers can help you have the law. And I'm not saying we're in any illegal, but you know, like. Um, it's, it's really difficult. It's, it's, it's the legal world is a world that you don't know. You're, you're building something. You, you want to you push it out. Um, so what do you do? Legal advice is very expensive. What, what does one do? Um, I, what would be really great to see is have the community come together because these are issues that are actually common to everybody. How do we solve this, this problem of maintaining responsibility while enabling these features that make this technology so special and, and something really quite new? Um, and you know, and one of these things is right now the regulators don't know yet what to do. Can we come up as a community with sound practices that deal with the things that we, that they and we care about? Um, how to deal with this technology responsibly? Um, how to um, have transparent processes so that there is an element of due process and informed participation? 
Um, these are rules that we can all make together across projects today, and, and that's something that we should work on. Uh, okay, so there's four. Oh, oh okay, wow, all right. Constance made questions grow. Um, okay, I think you're next. So my question goes back to some of the comments several of the lawyers made about getting out in front of the debate and influencing it before sort of they come and get us. Because I'm old enough to remember the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace the first time, you know, very giants of flesh and steel and all of that. The, the basic ideas leave us alone, but we've learned they won't leave us alone. And we ended up with some bad laws the first time around, the tripper chip, etc., etc. So my question is, it's one thing to talk about you know, come up with our own self-regulation, our own processes. But what specifically do you guys think could be done to influence, I hate to use the word lobbying, let's say, you know, defining the debate, uh, governments and regulators as a community? Um, it's really interesting, the self-regulatory question, and I'm always skeptical about what people's interests are. So you might have seen in the last I think week or so, something called the Crypto Rating Council, um, which is a, a from this conglomerate of all the big blockchain guys, right? Like they're like the new big banks, you know, Coinbase and Kraken and, and Cumberland. Like they decided that they were just going to uh, rate people and be like, you're a security, you're not a security. But if you're a security, you won't know because you don't show up on this thing. And there's no disclosure of the conflicts of interest. There's no transparency around the methodology. But at the same time, these are folks with deep connections to Washington, right? So Coinbase's um, GC um, is someone who's close with the uh, Nukin. And so there's all, there's all these, like, it's just this intrigue of, of folks. And we've seen also two recent settlements from the SEC that actually look very favorable. Um, EOS got a slap on the wrist, you know, $24 million for a $4 million raise. Not bad. It's just a cost of doing business. Cheaper than do an IPO. Um, side, side coin, side funds. Um, they also got a, a pretty, I think, light settlement. Um, but basically, their, their, their security token doesn't have to be registered, so that's great. Um, it's really, it's actually, I think, it bodes well. So there's, there's something happening where I don't know what it is that's going on behind the scenes, right? We're just little people. Um, um, but there's something happening. There are powers that be that are trying to negotiate some things, but is it also for their interest? So what do we do? Um, I think the only way to, to is to keep your head down and don't fuck up. Just just make shit that, that works for people, that there's actual adoption use case outside of crypto traders and, and being a toy, right? Like make things that actually matter um, for people. This is why we're building this uh, new set of tools. Um, and and, and that's, that's the only way, right? That's the only way to make the case. So. Yeah, we're not going to be able to get to all these questions. Um, One. Yeah. How do you propose dealing with the clash between the public, public policy objective of uh, uh, national security and anti-crime, anti-national crime, and on the other hand, the civil liberties uh, case for privacy and confidentiality? That seems to be one of the biggest problems in the world in the upcoming years, I think. So how do you propose doing that from the ground up, as seems to be the case here? Well, I, I mean, for me, um, I, I have a different story about this stuff that I'm not going to tell. But let, let, let's, um, let's just sort of work through the hypothetical like quickly. Like, like you know, I don't think that um, the blockchain technology we have today is in any way inhibiting law enforcement. It's certainly not more so than the cryptography in isolation, right? Like if, if you just said, okay, cryptography exists as a as math in the universe, right? Um, criminals have access to math, and they can figure out how to encrypt things, and that um, capability is going to be there. Um, I don't think that developing blockchain technology, broadly speaking, uh, facilitates crime in the in this. It's, it's a bit pedantic, but the law is a bit pedantic, right? I mean, th that's the nature of like playing the legal game. I, I don't, you know, when when, um, Mex when the Mexican drug cartel was kidnapping 
telco workers to force them to build a radio network so that they could directly communicate each other to ship drugs. No one pulled Motorola into a court and said, what are you doing making these radio chips? Right? They said, well, yeah, HSBC is a great example, right? I, I think that there's a, a legitimate and understandable anxiety around this question, but there's so many examples where if you weren't just being a criminal, no one misattributed crime to you. Um, and I think in our community, that's something that people have to come to terms with. It's like, we have to separate out the criminal activity from the non-criminal activity, and then this conversation becomes much easier to have. And, you know, with emerging technologies, I have not gotten up to speed on where we are at Morphic Encryption or ZKPs, exactly. But, you know, there is an opportunity for us to do some really interesting things with this technology that break that old binary that is, you're either, you know, if you have privacy, you know, you're, you're going to cut against national security. And in order to have robust national security, you know, you, you, you have to, you know, somehow give a, uh, some civil liberties and some, some right to privacy. And this, this zero sum maybe can be broken because technology enables different things. Maybe what we can do is have decentralized identity networks that use EKPs that allow people to have a token which doesn't share all your information and yet still allows people, some, some companies or organizations or DAOs, to check the OFAC list against their participants, make sure that they're not on this, this the, the terrorist financial list. Um, so that's one example. One of the things that we're, to answer the other gentleman's question as well, one of the things that we're working on in Koala is creating uh, a DAO model law. So and what this involves is looking at what are the goals behind the means, the mechanisms that traditional legal frameworks require. So usually, you know, if you want to have legal standing, capacity to sue or be sued, to, to actually legally own an asset that's off chain. These things usually require things like a traditional identification, registration, and jurisdiction. But behind those means, there are some goals that the policymakers are trying to achieve. And what we're doing as a mapping exercise is figuring out what, what of these goals can be met through technological guarantees. What, what can we claim is a functional equivalent to this rule? Because actually, we can't even follow those means anymore. They don't exist in the blockchain space. And then to create from there to still an alternative legal framework that meets these public policy goals. And with Koala, we have this wonderful benefit of having just incredible minds from diverse backgrounds contributing to this project, and also a very large academic network that gives heft to the fact that what we're doing is really a neutral, fact-based analysis for how we think the world should go forward. And then, you know, as we build this legitimacy and a chorus of voices to then socialize that with other stakeholders. Because people are, um, you know, they're, they are interested in listening. This is an opportunity that we have. They know this is something new. They, do, they know we, they don't know exactly quite what to do with it. We, 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 have, we have an opportunity to fill that vacuum with things that we can come up with. Oh, and, and just, uh, we, we have a workshop on Friday, 9 to 10.30, if any of you guys want to participate. Perfect. Um, this is the next question. Yeah, actually, it was uh, related to the uh, question that the gentleman asked a bit earlier. Like we chatted about, uh, just chatted about the Koala initiative. I really like uh, the work you guys are doing in general, like uh, like working and all and stuff. Uh, and when we talk a bit about like being proactive with the market, the, the you know uh, helping you know enforce regulations or being an active participant. So I was wondering if there was any. Like large committee effort to you know have this uh, conversation and have like something that can be uh, yeah considered by the authorities and stuff. But they, yeah, so what's really part answer for me. So the question is, are there any community yeah, or organizations that like call it one uh, with like uh, movements to make this happen? There's also a new one um, called ENAFPA, it's the International Association of Trusted Blockchain Applications. They just formed this summer uh, and have, they're very close to Brussels. It's, I mean, they are not only European, they're meant to be worldwide. So they're trying to get the regulators on one table. 
Um, the issue, however, I've seen with this, and this is a general problem, is that there are a lot of like legacy institutions, such as very big banks, um, big institutions, big corporates, who have a very different agenda than um, we have. So just trying to get um, a point across which comes mainly from this ecosystem is difficult because they, they, the interests very much clash. So I think what we have to do is basically gather the people who are interested in this and driving this forward um, within you know, this, this community and not with the big corporates. I mean, we have to talk to them and we have to find common grounds, but we first need to know what we actually want before we talk to them. Or like, um, you know, because they, they bulldoze us over right now. Um, do we have, how much time do we have left in the room? I mean, you guys, you guys can go on for 20 minutes if you want. Do you, do you folks want to go on for 20 minutes? And you, can, you can stop anytime, but I'm just saying, you know, another yeah. 20 minutes if you need. So, I mean, I think there's more questions, there's, there's four more questions. Um, I don't, I guess we'll just go front to back, so this guy is closer. So, I'm interested in, uh, if you could share some examples of breakthroughs in blockchain law innovation, uh, like specific examples or jurisdictions or states or laws that are starting to allow for more innovation or innovations that have gone through and are starting to come to fruition. So it seems that at the moment um, it's always smaller states, the smaller states are more agile, um, that actually come up with new solutions to help the blockchain space. This is not necessarily that they are good solutions, but they are solutions. And what happens is you basically, for example, you have in the DAO space, you have Malta. They um, are in the process of giving uh, legal personality to DAOs. I do not necessarily agree with how they do it, because what they do is like they may turn a DAO into what it is not, like just a corporate entity. Um, other jurisdictions, uh, Switzerland has been very active in uh, facilitating uh, the crypto um, community, and especially in relation to securities laws. Um, so it comes basically, the smaller states, they infect in a way the bigger states, and hopefully they're infected with the right disease, and not the wrong one. Um, other than that, do you have any other good examples of jurisdictions? That's probably it. And then, I mean, you know, also we should mention uh, Gibraltar. They were very early in having a crypto regulatory framework, which was principle is principle based. So it's based on principle, not you know, it's technologically agnostic. Um, it's very wide, so they can just you know they can kind of uh, innovate within those very principles. But in my opinion, also for of Gibraltar, they are overreaching on AML. Um, because they try even to um, have decentralized taxes or to follow the AML laws, which some people in the community support, some others don't. Um, but for us, I think the goal would be to approach a smaller jurisdiction. We write, you know, we draft something we think is good, like something based on technology and on the functions. And have that implemented in a smaller state and then hope that it catches on. Because that was the same way with, you know, the LLC was invented in Wyoming and Wyoming wasn't really, isn't really known for its corporate laws, but then, you know, Delaware took it and then it went all around the world and that's how you get uh, laws spread. Yeah, uh, this other, yeah, you have an answer one. Um, so it's a really good earlier question by like for builders um, who are trying to basically push the boundaries of some of these innovations which are quite hard to figure out in the legal landscape. Um, obviously like trying to get legal advice every time is quite costly and also sometimes not practical but like I'll say a lot of lawyers could tell you like what not to do. Like, Tell you, it's like, okay, we can never right? tell you what to do. Right. I, I really so, 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 I guess I'm, I'm, I'm asking more for like personal, I guess, like not from like legal advice, but like just out of your personal advice is like, what would be like practical advice to these builders? Like, you have some, you have some examples, like, 
views, for example, was just done like the offering and then they just got fine. Which is okay, like I mean like 44 million out of like 4 million ICO is like not a big of a deal in some sense. Or you can also like recommend to like move jurisdiction to some smaller regions that are more flexible. Or like are the things anonymous like is there any like, personal points you guys have? I wouldn't suggest doing things anonymous. <laughs> If you have the money, you should get an in-house lawyer because in-house lawyer can tell you much more, give you much more frank advice. Because as a, if you work as a law firm as a lawyer, they basically hedge their risks. So they don't give you, they, they won't give you a legal opinion which has uh, hundreds of assumptions and it's based on this, based on this. Then you can maybe do this, but this is, you know, it depends. So if you have the money, you should always have an in-house lawyer um, who can assess. Um, the risks and also depends always you know it's a risk spectrum do you want to just keep out of jail you know like how much risk do you want to take and a lawyer will then advise you um, what the right approach is um, if you cannot afford a lawyer or like not in-house I think as you spoke about um, jurisdictions I mean forum shopping for your company is a very good idea and there are some group, very crypto-friendly um, jurisdictions where it's much better to have your company than others. Um, and also offshore jurisdictions that aren't that expensive, but there are some limitations on... And I mean, may, maybe don't live in the US, I mean... That would be <laughs> nice. I, I think one point on the, on the jurisdiction question is that... Um, you, there's something called long arm jurisdiction, and the U.S. has a very, very long arm. So, so it's not it's not enough that you don't um, you're not in the U.S. or you're you're somehow in Switzerland because if you are targeting U.S. persons, then you are liable, right? And the only way to find out conclusively that you're not targeting U.S. persons is to do KYC for everybody because geo blocking is not sufficient in in and of itself because VPN access is pretty easy. So. So unfortunately, there's there's um, there are all these uh, issues around um, <laughs> patchworks of, of regulations. I want to say something about that. If you can't really do all the you know yeah. do all the KYC blocking the US is really unfortunate, but it's a very the reason why US is always blocked is because of legal, legal reasons, and it's geo blocking is still like kind of a, it's not a full defense, but it's geo blocking is. A defense plus terms and conditions saying U.S. persons are not allowed to participate. That's not a long-term solution, but that's what projects right now adapt, and it's one of the less risky approaches in the space. Okay. Um, yeah. Solid. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, it was interesting. I started with like code is law, or you know, sort of a joke that code isn't law. Um, but kind of going back to the DAO hack, um, you know, I think one of you was saying that maybe the, the DAO could have specified that like code isn't law or code is law or we're going to go under the state of Delaware legal jurisdiction. But does any of that even really matter? Because honestly, like you know, you had the sort of nebulous we of the Ethereum community that ultimately decided what to do. So like in any of these networks, isn't like the real legal jurisdiction the decentralized network? If you actually are. I spend a lot of time talking to lawyers, and something that they charge you a lot of money for, and they say very often, is it depends. <laughs> so, I mean, my personal view is that, it, as, a, as a developer, as someone who helps teams and works with teams to build technical solutions, um, I, I think that and again, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm you know not all of us on this panel. You know, only a minority of us are not lawyers. The 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 lawyers want you know their business is to sell. My business is to sell people technical advice, and so I I fall under the same sort of um, I guess moral hazards that lawyers fall under because their job is to sell you legal advice, and so I immediately like see it. You know, I'm like oh that guy just totally like drag this conversation on for another 15 minutes for no reason and you, we just gave him $300, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, so, so do these protections help? I mean, they do help in, this, in a particular abstract frame, right? But in your particular instance, in your particular case, you have to have the sort of sophistication, the savvy as a person participating in this 
business or whatever you want to call it, community, to to make that decision for yourself. Like ultimately, your lawyers, you know, to be frank, are almost certainly not going to go to jail. And you know, it's your it's your own. You know, you you know, do your own research. You have to protect yourself. I I don't think that it's so I guess I, I was uh, inadvertently completely skipped a part of your question. No, I do not think it is the blockchain community that ultimately makes the decision. I think it's the people with guns who will chase after you and kick down your door that are ultimately making the decision. Or if we use the portable one. Like, let's see where it goes in 100 years, you know? Just, let's see where it goes in 100 years. And I would, I don't know, I would also say that I would love to see an initiative from this community because lawyers are not necessarily incentivized to give people active advice, um, to see some sort of initiative come out of the community to finance and find that ethical space of like positive legal advice and have a coalition have protections around that. It's a long ask, but I think that's Wall is probably the closest organization to do so. But that's what I see about the kind of, it doesn't necessarily address your question, but all of the questions in general, but I see that there is like a vacuum and a real need for this for devs. The other issue that's kind of been lurking is there's the law, which is sort of the minimum standard, and then there's a sense of what is legitimacy. Like, so you're saying you can have all these legal um, kind of pipings in place, but then a bunch of people decide to do something anyway. Now, is that legitimate? And 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 perhaps some of the framing is a way of, of, of creating or disproving legitimacy. So someone could have potentially sued. Um, so, I mean, I, I imagine part of what animated the decision to go and get people's money back was, well, this is the equitable thing to do, to get people's money back, because based on the expectations that people wouldn't just willy-nilly willy lose their money to due to a bug code that wasn't in their power and control. They entrusted that to the developers to do that. So that would be the right thing to do in order to facilitate and keep the experiment going, right? This is. It's about that trust between people. This is the right thing to do. And maybe others thought that that wasn't a legitimate act. Like, who are you to come in and do this versus the coach? So, it, so those are you. Those are the questions that lead to the fundamental disputes. And you just use the law in different ways to to, to buttress your position, right? So if someone could have seen this if that's not legitimate based on this set of rules that we had, the law, and then you're you're importing. Um, a whole body of law into what you're choosing, right? You're choosing Delaware law for this, and you can say, well, under this corporate, we're making an analogy now to, to these cases and, and so forth, therefore they have no legitimacy, and the remedy is X. Um, and someone else can make a different argument. So it's, the, the law can be used as tools that allow people to, to reframe the argument. Yeah. So there are tools to, make, to, to put hurdles in place to sue you, basically. So what you do is, to you minimize your risk. I mean, your question is always, how do I minimize the risk? I put hurdles in place. I put a choice of law in my agreements. I put terms of the conditions. And it becomes then harder to sue you and to get you, basically. And uh, I think this is the final question in the back. Uh, yeah, thanks for making time. Um, so with regards to regulation, just thinking about the history of regulation, my understanding is that regulation is required when you get like a market externality. The two people doing business and there's a negative side effect that doesn't impose a cost on those two actors. Um, most notably in the 1930s after the Great Depression, you had a lot of financial regulation coming to kind of prevent that. And my question is, what are the negative externalities uh, that the blockchain space gives rise to? And can we actively regulate against those, or do we have to wait for the mistakes to happen and then make kind of uh, retroactive regulation? That was a really interesting question. Uh, unfortunately, we're in the back of the room. Uh, yeah, that was really that's really interesting. I'm gonna let the lawyers respond. Do we have any thoughts? What do you, what do you mean by proactively prevent the negative externality? Oh, so basically, wait for the the massive mistake to happen first, like the Great Depression, and then makes rules to regulate against that happening. It's already happened. You know the, 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 the Great Depression or whatever, you could argue that it already happened with the, the ICO boom when you know, the companies that went all bust and you, invented, you invested all your money. So, I mean, the protection of the consumers in that respect, you could 
maybe not, that's not the correct term in economics, in economic terms, you could call that ex uh, an externality which the regulators seek to regulate. And we already see it, it's all about consumer protection and money laundering, anti-money laundering concerns mainly. And you know, if we manage to get rid of those externalities in the space privately by self-regulation, the regulators are less keen to regulate. But unfortunately, what we've seen already, there have there have been you know fallout fallouts of that, and that well is why we are now in this position having this problem. Yeah. So I think the blockchain community as a whole is far too large to sort of do what you're describing. I think that there is absolutely, though, a subset of people who are interested in doing exactly what you're describing, and, and there are the people that are on this panel, the people that we talk to, and there's, of course, people that feel this way that we don't talk to, but, um, you know, the, the I, yeah, I think the DAO, you know, the, the, the DAO, the, the, the boom-bust cycle that we see on all crypto assets, the natural volatility, um, what I was sort of interpreting when you were first speaking was more of, um, you know, what happens when you have to go to the Ethereum blockchain to like access some controversial video recording of Trump, right? Like, I mean, that to me is like a really like possible situation that we're in. Um, and then, and then, and then, how would we as a community respond to that or? You know, you could be particularly trollish, right? You could say every blockchain, you know, I put this data on all these blockchains, here's how you access this horrible video or whatever. Um, and, and, you know, and do it in this trollish way where there is a sort of large incentive for Trump to go berserk and try to stop it, right? And, and you just sort of push the question to the fore. Um, I feel like that's the kind of event that we're not, as a community, prepared for. Like, it's that sort of situation. I think, you know, fraud and sort of more conventional crime, drug dealing, even like gun running, international crimes, that stuff I think we can sort of handle as a community because, you know, you have the outlaws and the people who are trying to operate within the law. But these sort of, you know, we live in this new political, I mean, I, I think for, you know, I grew up in the 80s, you know, maybe it was because I was a kid or whatever, but the political climate that we're in now, it seems like there's this real political risk that we have with technology, that even with clipper chip and like these other things, like the, 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 the stakes weren't really the same. It seems like the stakes have really changed, and I don't think that there's much we can do about, about those types of problems. Certain types of preventative or prophylactic regulation ends up also causing all of its own negative externalities. So you've seen with KYC and ML rules, um, and just with, with you know the whole ICO. Like I mean, what it's actually pushing at is who gets to access capital markets. Right. So part of it, it those rules are in place is to protect investors who are somehow less sophisticated or less able to absorb losses because they just don't have as much money. Right. Uh, but then that also prevents people from having opportunities to access growth, especially in an economic scenario today where wages are stagnant and most wealth creation is now through capital appreciation. So if you start preventing ordinary people from accessing capital appreciating opportunities, then they kind of stay poor. Right. Sorry, I, I, won't, I won't ask because actually it's oh, time. Yeah, 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 y